chapter 56, verse 1. This is God's word. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hands from doing evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting covenant that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. All you beasts of the field come to devour. All you beasts of the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so grateful that you use your word to transform lives. We are so grateful that you have given us this passage to help us understand you and to see your great love and your mercy and your passion for saving sinners. And we pray, God, that today you will use this text to humble us, to remind us of the grace that we who know you have received. And if there be anyone here today that is outside of the grace of Jesus Christ this morning, who has not yet bowed the knee to him as king, I pray that, Lord, you would use these words in Isaiah 56, to transform them, to bring them to a point where they come to the end of themselves and see Jesus Christ as Lord, that they would repent and believe and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we jump into the main points of the text this morning, there are two preliminary observations that I would like to make first. The reason that I want to address these things up front is that I want us to be very clear from the jump how we are supposed to bring these Old Covenant commands into the New Covenant church. First, we need to be reminded that although this chapter was written for us, it was not written to us. This message is being spoken to the southern kingdom of Judah who was under the Old Covenant law. So for the Israelites, there was no distinction between biblical law, biblical commands, and governmental law or governmental commands. The law of God was the law of the land. If you want to know what their code was, just read the first five books of the Bible. That was their instruction about how to live. That is what they were supposed to be enforcing in their lands. But we who live in the New Testament era do not live in a theocracy like that. America is not a Christian nation. Our laws are not identical to God's laws. Not only that, but we do not live under the old covenant commands any longer. Even as the church, we are not held fast by those rules. For this reason, some of the classifications of those who love and honor the Lord would look different for us than it would look like for them. For example, verse 7 speaks of burnt offerings and sacrifices. Well, these are not actions of new covenant believers. So does this mean that we have nothing to glean from this chapter? Absolutely not. If you look closely, God is not chiefly concerned with the actions that he is highlighting in this chapter. Rather, he is chiefly concerned with the heart beneath them. As has always been the case, God is interested in the heart. 
the old covenant believer would display their love for God by following the old covenant law. The new covenant believer displays his love for God by following the law of Christ or the new covenant commands. Closely related to this, please consider a second preliminary observation concerning the Sabbath. Three times in this chapter, the Lord highlights the Sabbath observance as an indication that somebody truly loves and honors the Lord. This chapter is actually highly poetic in its structure. The way that it's designed is brilliant Hebrew poetry. And that's why you see it organized so symmetrically with these Sabbath statements. You see them in chapter uh, verse 2, verse 4, and verse 6. Let me read them again to you in sequence, and I want to see if you can find a common thread in these three statements as it builds on what it means to observe the Sabbath. Verse 2, Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Verse 4, For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, and hold fast my covenant. Verse 6, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant. These three verses all use different words, but the same concept that runs through all three of them is intentionally paralleled. The one who keeps the Sabbath is the same one who will keep his hand from doing evil and is the same one who will choose to do the things that please the Lord and is the same one who will keep his covenant and is the same person who will minister to the Lord and love the Lord and be the servant of the Lord. So we who live under the new covenant are no longer required to have a day each week where we observe rest. Hebrews chapter 4 teaches us that Jesus himself is our Sabbath rest. So, we who live in the New Covenant are not called to take this day of physical rest, but just as we read here, the heart beneath the Sabbath observance, the heart of love and service to the Lord, that should burn brightly in all believers for all time. All right, now with those concepts firmly established, let's now jump into the main meaning of this passage. Our outline today is going to be very simple. It's going to be based off of a verse that we read on Friday in our daily Bible reading. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Point number one, we're actually going to begin at the end of that statement. God gives grace to the humble. And point number two will be God opposes the proud. One of the interesting facets of Isaiah 56 is that it doesn't ever command us to do anything. There are actually never any direct commands for you or I to obey. In fact, this chapter is just a poetic explanation of how God is going to receive outcasts and cast out the wicked. And that is why the Lord chooses two metaphors to describe those that he will bring into his kingdom. He speaks of eunuchs and he speaks of foreigners. Let's consider each of those in context of Isaiah's day. Now, the Israelites have been taught by the Lord to always welcome foreigners. We see that all throughout the law. They are to make provision for them, but they are not to imitate them. They are not to worship their gods, and they are not to intermarry with them, yet they are to be kind to them. And the Lord made provision for Gentiles who would be traveling in Israelite lands to find hospitality and to find food and to experience peace. However, years of war and invasion resulted in a great deal of suspicion and fear of foreigners in the Israelite people, in particular the people of Judah. And right now, if you look around our world, there's a good illustration that might be had. Consider there is a war going on in Ukraine. There is a war because Russia has invaded them and is seeking to expand its borders. And right now, we don't know the outcome of what will take place in the future of those lands. But for the sake of illustration, just imagine this with me. Imagine Russia loses the war. Imagine they end up retreating back to their borders by the end of 2022, and the Ukrainian people begin returning to their homes, and they begin rebuilding their bombed-out cities. Now flash forward about a decade, maybe 2032, and imagine that a Russian man is traveling through Ukraine. How do you think he's going to be received? 
even if he had nothing to do with the fighting, even if that man personally and verbally opposed the Russian government invading Ukraine 10 years earlier, how do you think that guy is going to be received by the Ukrainians? Do you think the Ukrainians are going to view him with suspicion, anger, malice, distrust, to put it mildly? That's just some of the sentiments that might be common. Now, Judah, they had been at war with everybody around them. They had been at war constantly. They had been at war in the past with Egypt and Assyria and Edom and Tyre and Sidon and Syria, and they had blood feuds with basically everybody. These nations would come in, they would fight some of the outlying cities of their region, and they would destroy them, and the people would retreat to Jerusalem, and then eventually Israel would win, Judah would win, and the enemies would leave, and they would go back and rebuild. But they were not kind at that point towards outsiders. They were not looking fondly at those who were foreigners. Even so, that does not negate the fact that the Israelites had been given a job to do. They were supposed to represent the Lord to all nations. They were supposed to teach the rest of the world about him. In order to prove this, I'm just going to walk through a very small portion of the Bible. I'm just going to go to the book of Psalms and read to you just a couple of snippets from four consecutive chapters and cherry pick a couple of verses. We'll start in Psalm 96, verses 3 and 4. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Now this is the hymnal of the Israelite people. And in their songbook, it declares, because God is great and worthy of praise, therefore your job is to tell everyone about him. Let's just flip over to the next chapter. Chapter 97, verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Now, coastlands in the Old Testament is a way of speaking of all distant lands. Let's turn to the next chapter. Psalm 98, 3 through 4. He has remembered his steadfast love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and praises. What about the next chapter? Chapter 99, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon, upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. And that's not speaking about the land. It's talking about the people who live in the lands. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Jump down to verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now, that's just four consecutive chapters out of the middle of one book of the Old Testament. That takes up literally two pages in my Bible. And I just cherry-picked four sections of four chapters where I showed you that the job of the Israelites... Their calling was to proclaim the goodness and grace of the Lord to the surrounding lands. And that's just a couple out of a myriad of passages that express that same concept. Now, for the most part of the history of Israel, the people refused to honor these commands. They did a terrible job of being a witness to the Lord. And they did not preach the good news to those outside. And eventually, during the time of Jesus, the Pharisee party would actually become very committed to, let's call it, missions. And they would travel all over the world, and they would try to convince others to follow after their teachings. But sadly, their message was not the message they were told to take. Their message had been corrupted. This is what Jesus says of their missionary efforts in Matthew 23, 15. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. You're not doing them any good. The message you're taking them is actually hurting them, not helping them. You're convincing them that they're fine with God when they are still far from him. Isaiah 56 has good news for those who are far off. There is a promise that the foreigner will find a place in God's house. Look again at the beginning of verse 3. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. He will not. You belong to him now. Now, before I move any farther, I think it is really vital for us to put ourselves in the position of understanding that the promises 
made to the covenant people of God in the Old Testament did not have to be true for you, but God brings Gentile people like you and I into the great promises because his love is boundless and free. And so he has chosen people like you and I using promises like these. So do not overlook the fact that he says foreigners. That is not just anyone. That is you. And he says God has come to bring you into his promises. Now jump down to verse 7 where he continues addressing the foreigner again. And he says, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Do you remember where this passage is quoted in the New Testament? It's one of the more bombastic moments of Jesus' ministry. You you remember the last week before the cross, Jesus was in the temple courts, and he was there flipping over the tables of the money changers. It is very difficult to envision that going down mildly, right? Jesus walks in and he begins destroying the system that they had put in place. And do you know what part of the temple he was in? He was in the court of the Gentiles. That was the area that had been designated for foreigners to come and worship, the people who had come from other lands who had trusted in God. It also happened to be the largest part of the temple courts. And this was the area where people were supposed to come from every corner of the earth to worship the Lord together. But instead, the Sanhedrin had turned it into a place to set up stalls to sell the sacrificial animals that people were required by God to sacrifice. It was the perfect grift. On a financial level, it's kind of like when you go to the movie theater and you see the popcorn. And you smell the popcorn. According to one book I recently read, that popcorn at the movie theater is literally the highest markup of any regularly sold good in America. Now, this was written in 2017, but it said, for the largest uh, container of popcorn that you purchase, the theater pays five cents, including the popcorn, the container, and the labor to make it. And then you pay $13.50. It is quite literally the highest markup of anything. But people still buy it. Why? Because people can't imagine watching a movie without popcorn. And so it's also conveniently placed. And you can't bring any in on your own. So the Sanhedrin, who controlled the temple courts, they would only permit their own stalls to be set up. And they would charge a premium to people who traveled a long distance to Jerusalem. Look, you're not going to go 45 miles in a cart with a bunch of animals. Like, look, I've got my kids, my wife, and a bunch of animals that I'm going to sacrifice. No, you just pay the extra fee and you buy it there. But there's a big difference between this and popcorn. Because God doesn't demand that you buy popcorn at the movie theater. You can just say no. But he does demand that the people who come to worship on the high holy days make sacrifices. So the Gentiles' place of worship, where they were to gather and pray, that was co-opted by the very people who had failed to carry the good news to the ends of the earth. Those same people who were not missional took the place where those converts were supposed to come and pray and turned it into a place to make money. Mark eleven seventeen, Jesus flipped over the money changers' tables, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, and said, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. What's the point? Simply this. The heart of a true servant of God will be a heart that is concerned with God's glory going to the world. The world is excellent at tribalizing. I think that's very evident. Nobody has to argue that too, too hardly, uh, harshly. It is simple to see. People find ways to divide and collectivize under all kinds of different banners. But the kingdom of God does not discriminate against any language or tribe or skin color or culture. God has a people in Ukraine and he has a people in Russia. He has a people in Joss, Nigeria. He has a people in Mexico City. He has a people in London and in Levittown. He has a people around this planet to whom we are called to carry the good news. 
And you can confidently carry that good news to every people group because this promise is found in Isaiah chapter 56. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 reveals that Jesus has fulfilled this promise at the cross which says, for he himself is our peace. Peace mean, means reconciling force, the one that brings us together, who has made us both, speaking of Jews and Gentiles, one, and he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Look, there used to be a separation, but no longer. We are considered one in Christ. Now, you might not carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, but you do carry it with you wherever you go. You might not go to Nigeria. You will, however, have an opportunity to go to your neighbors. You might never leave Long Island, but you will have unbelievers around you pretty much every day. So the heart of God's servant is concerned with God's glory going out to the whole world. But it's not just the foreigner who is invited in this passage. The Lord also makes note of the eunuch. Now, the eunuch is one who has physically been transformed in order to limit a man from producing offspring. Eunuchs were often prisoners of war. Occasionally, someone would volunteer to become a eunuch in order to serve in a position of authority, particularly in cases where they were working alongside a female ruler or to serve a female female member of the royal family. So without getting into the nitty-gritty details, I will simply say to those that uh, are here, the ones who experienced this kind of procedure were intentionally cut off from having any progeny left behind them. They were not supposed to have children. And what is the point of amassing wealth if you have no one to pass it along to? These people were not permitted to own anything and were not allowed to pass anything on to future generations. So for this reason, they were often happy to live well-fed, well-cared for, as servants in high and lofty positions. They were treated well by their patrons, but their benefits ended with their life. However, being a eunuch came with spiritual limitations as well. The Old Covenant set clear boundaries for those who were in this position. Now, although it's awkward to read it, Consider Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1. It says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. What's he talking about there? He's talking about eunuchs. These people are not permitted even into the outer court of the Gentiles when the temple is constructed. They are not allowed to gather in public worship. So this man was in this situation not able to have descendants, not able to own anything, and not allowed to worship the Lord in public spaces. That is the epitome of an outcast. Regardless of their position near royalty, socially they were still an outcast. But Isaiah chapter 56 makes promises to even such a person as this and says, And let not the eunuchs say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Now what does that mean? Simply put, it means... Dry tree is a reference to inability to produce offspring. And he says, no, don't even say that about yourselves. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. For those who are paying close attention, that is intentional language. If you have no children, your name dies with you. That's how their system worked. How is it then that God promises to give a monument and a name that is everlasting and that will not be cut off? If eunuchs are not permitted to own property, how is it that they are promised a house within God's walls? For the same reason that you and I have a hope and a future. Because this world is just a small portion of our existence. We are welcomed into a kingdom that has promises, not for this life only, but also for the life to come. Jesus promised that he has gone to prepare a place for us, and that when he returns, he is going to take us where he has gone. Consider Acts chapter 8. Francesco read that very well for us this morning. Remember that Ethiopian eunuch, that man from Africa who heard the gospel that day? He was reading what? He was reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 53 in particular. He had just left Jerusalem, and consider that man was not permitted in the temple courts. He was not permitted to go into a synagogue. 
he was not permitted to gather in public worship. That man was, religiously speaking, unclean. And he was earnestly seeking to understand the Lord. He was seeking to read and understand the Bible, but it seems as though nobody had ever taught him the good news. So Philip explained the gospel to him, and that man who had no hope and no future found an inheritance in Jesus Christ. He was saved, and he was baptized, and then we arrive at this bizarre moment in the story, Acts chapter 38, verse 39 through 40. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Now, we don't know if that means literally he was, like, whisked away spiritually, like he just disappeared. Like, he goes down in the water and then comes up, and he's, like, drying his eyes, looking around, and Philip is just missing. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it just means that Philip was taught by the Spirit and led by the Spirit to leave and depart, and then as he's making his way out, Uh, He was teaching the gospel in every town until he came to Caesarea. We don't know for sure, but what we do know is this. Philip disappears. And this man, who is newly saved, got back in his chariot, and he spent the rest of his journey home rejoicing. Well, I'm wondering to myself, I wonder if he kept that scroll open, the one that Philip had just explained to him, and he continued reading beyond chapter 53. And he read chapter 54. And he read chapter 55. And then, can you imagine the joy of that man when he arrived at chapter 55 or 56, where we are today? This prophecy that was given 700 years before that man was saved. And he read that his lowly estate would be blessed and that he would have a, an inheritance in the family of God. What joy would he have? So what's the point? Simply this. Verse 8 says, The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Are there people that you think are too far gone to hear the gospel? Maybe you don't think that they'll hear it because maybe they're in a different place economically from you. Maybe they're at the really high end or the really low end. Of the scale. Maybe they are politically distant from you, and you can't imagine somebody who doesn't agree with you on anything politically agreeing with you about the Lord Jesus Christ and believing in Him. Maybe they are socially distant from you, or maybe they are hygienically distant from you, or maybe they are geographically or comically or racially or culturally distant from you. Perhaps the people Christians engage with the least, the ones that are farthest from our purview are the ones who are currently waving rainbow flags this time of year. God saves sinners. If you're in the kingdom, it's because he saves the foreigner and the eunuch, the sinner, the outcast. He brings them in. And we have the ability to boldly proclaim to all people the good news because those who hear and repent and believe will be saved regardless of who they are or what they have done before knowing Christ. And Jesus will have the bride for whom he died. All who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And that is the message that we can carry. That is the message that we can proclaim. And that is the message that we are told to take to the ends of the earth. So that is point number one. God gives grace to the humble. We now move to the shorter but very significant second point. God opposes the proud. In the 1930s, a new style of writing began to emerge English-speaking world. Uh, Dystopian novels began to pop up all over the place, but would truly become common in the years following the Second World War. We see, for example, in the 1930s, Brave New World, and then in the 40s, Fahrenheit 451, and in the 50s, 1984. Those are some of the most well-known cornerstones of dystopian fiction. These are marked with a deep pessimism about the heart of man and the future of world governments. One such novel is Animal Farm by George Orwell. In in it, the animals on the farm set up their own government built on seven commandments. And the seventh seventh commandment is that all animals are equal. However, as time goes on, that commandment does not get lived out well by these sentient animals. It is there that we find these most famous of all quotes from dystopian novels. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. In this last section of Isaiah 56, God speaks of the people of Judah like they are animals. 
he refers to them as farm creatures. It seems that this particular focus is probably on the leaders of Judah, but let's be honest, there's plenty of blame to go around. Listen again to the concluding verses of this section and hear the scorn that God has for the arrogance and pride of these people. Verse 9, all you beasts of the field, come to devour all you beasts in the forest. Now, let's pause. Who are the, these beasts that he's speaking about? Likely, this is not a call to the people of Judah. Likely, this is God putting his hand to his mouth and calling out to the other nations and saying, Hey, you guys, get over here. There's a feast to be had. Hey, you guys, all you beasts of the forest, come here to Israel. Come to Judah. Come to Jerusalem and devour these people. Who are these beasts? Well, likely they're the armies of Assyria and Babylon. Both nations are spoken of using these exact terms throughout the minor prophets. And God is calling them to Jerusalem to come and devour the wicked and proud Israelites. And the next verse is going to reveal that the people of Judah should be ready. They should be prepared. They should be on guard against such beasts, but they are not. Verse 10, his watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. I have a dog. Many of you have met my dog. His name is Rupert. Technically, his name is Prince Rupert of the Rhine. But if you've ever met Rupert, then you know that he's really, he's not much of a dog, to be honest. He's like eight inches tall, and he weighs less than the feral barn cats that I had growing up. And he sleeps often. I mean, to be, to be honest, he's basically a stuffed animal, like 80% of the time. <laughs> so I can't tell you how many times people have come to my house and then sat down on the couch and then apologized because they say, oh, I'm so sorry for sitting on Rupert. I, I thought he was a pillow. That happens often. But you know what? Even that dog, even that dreaming, snoozy, sleepy, tiny little dog, even that dog has enough sense that when the door opens or the mailman clicks the mailbox, even that dog has enough sense to bark and warn us that there might be an intruder. Even that dog has the sense to say, hey, owner, wake up, somebody's here. The leaders of Judah are described as being blind and without knowledge. They can't see the danger that's coming against them. They don't know enough to protect themselves. But it didn't have to be this way. They could have listened to the Lord. They could have listened to his teachings and prevented the judgment that was coming. And they could have, at the very least, heard the warnings of Isaiah and warned the people of the coming judgment. Instead, what do they do? They scoff at the prophecies, and they continued living as practical atheists, thinking that God's commands are of no value to me, and God's warnings will never come to pass. They weren't interested in caring for the people or protecting them. They were only interested in in getting what they wanted each day. Why? Because to borrow from Orwell, they thought that they were more equal than others. They put themselves at the top, and they wanted to stay there. Verse 11, the dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. So these dogs are not doing their job guarding the flock. Instead, they constantly feed themselves. Now, this is a reference to the self-enriching tactics of the rulers of Israel, Think again of those temple courts and how the Sanhedrin were enriching themselves. Notice how Isaiah quickly shifts from calling them dogs to now calling them shepherds. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. They all have turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond all measure." Now, last week, we heard the call of God to come and get free wine without price. But these leaders of Israel were unwilling to come to the fountain of the Lord. They sought to be fulfilled with every earthly treasure that could be gained. And their faulty assumption was that every day in the future would be just as filled with peace and plenty as the last. Tomorrow is going to be just like today, they thought, so let's just keep living it up. But the promise of judgment arrives swiftly and unexpectedly to those who are under the judgment. One of the chief expressions of pride that we can display is living for today instead of living for eternity. The lifestyle of these leaders of Judah denied that there was a God who ruled over them and would eventually judge them. So here's the bottom line. 
How are you living? And what are you living for? Are you just looking to the next vacation? Are you just living for retirement? Are you solely focused on an evening of rest after your hard day of work and your favorite TV show? Or is your life built around listening to and responding to the Lord? Pride is self-worship. It is at the very core of every other sin that you commit. All other sins are symptoms of pride. And God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let me close our time with one final verse from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, where he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we ask that you would please break any pride that is in our hearts, any place where we have elevated ourselves, considered ourselves greater than we are, put ourselves on some kind of a pedestal, worshipped ourselves. God, we pray that you would break our pride and that we would see you rightly. For when we see your holiness, when we see your love, when we truly encounter you, there is nothing we can do but say, woe is me, I am undone like Isaiah did back in chapter 6. And God, we pray that we would be humbled by you, that we would experience you rightly, and that we would live for you. Lord, I pray that we would never get over the fact that you have brought foreigners and outsiders like us into your family, that we who were undeserving have been given the greatest gift imaginable through the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news that brings sinners like us in. We thank you that it was that good news that Philip taught the eunuch that day that saved his soul. And it was that same good news that trickled down throughout the generations to us that we have heard and we have believed. And we pray, God, that you would cause us to now take that message and that we would spread it to the ends of the earth. We ask, Lord, that you would bring in a great harvest in this community and through the ministry of the people in this congregation that we might see your hand at work saving many. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.